Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. For Monday, April the 10th, 2017, I am back from South Padre Island, where I attended the National Tropical Weather Conference uh, over the past few days. Thursday and Friday were the two conference days, and there was a lot of mingling amongst some very great people in the forecast business of hurricanes, engineering, storm surge modeling, weather broadcasting, you name it. It's a really intimate conference where you can get to know some of the people and they can get to know people like me too. Got to embrace that as our projects become more successful. More people know who I am and the success of those projects means that they start to seek me out and want to talk to me and that's uh, an honor that I take very seriously. But I got to tell you, it really is amazing to be able to sit down with somebody like Dr. Neil Frank or my good friend Max Mayfield, who I have known uh, for almost 17 years now, and just continue to talk about one of our favorite subjects, and that is hurricanes. We always learn from each other year after year, so it's good to be back in the office. I've got a few things to go over today. There's a lot to digest and sort of figure out in terms of what I want to talk about uh, in terms of what I learned at this conference, I'll give you a hint. We really have to, I think, focus more on water rather than wind and get away from this idea of, oh, what category is that hurricane? And that is the determining factor as to what you're going to do about it. we got to get away from that and really focus more on the water. So let's move into today's discussion. As usual, I like to start with the sea surface temperature anomalies. And you can see the eastern Pacific here still warmer than it should be. But this is a curious little snake of cold, colder water starting to show up right through there. I'm going to highlight it in yellow right through here, a little bit cooler. And I'm going to show you where that might be coming from in just a minute. The central Pacific over here towards the western Pacific, uh, out between eh, 140 to 160 plus longitude. Still running colder than the long-term average at the surface and the subsurface, which I'll show you in a moment. Look at this. This is interesting to me. The main development region here on today's update, and this is updated here the 10th of April, starting to warm up a little bit. Remember how cold it was relative to average out here recently? The western Atlantic and the southwest Atlantic still has these weird patches of colder than average water temperatures. Um, but I'm going to keep an eye on this. We'll see how long this persists and whether or not this fills in more. And, you know, it's getting to be that time, especially considering that we have had the first seasonal forecast come out from Dr. Phil Klotzbach. Uh, also, I think despite what people think about seasonal forecasting, you got to start somewhere, and he is truly dedicated to that science. And it might take 10, 15, 20 years. Think about where Dr. William Gray started and how far we have come since the mid-80s, at the very least, right, in terms of where we are now. So we'll talk about that in much more detail over the coming weeks. I'll give you a little taste of it today. So this is what I wanted to show you moving along in the presentation, the sea surface temperature anomaly along the equatorial Pacific in the subsurface area. Okay, so we're talking about uh, depths of, well, maybe 450 meters plus. This is the surface up here. This would be 450 meters deep. And we're talking about maybe near Indonesia over on the left-hand side and over on the right-hand side over here, left and right, uh, maybe the coast of South America, just to give you an idea of what this cross-section is. So here's that very warm water in the subsurface showing up. And we saw that on the map previously. But then you still have this bowl of colder than normal water temperatures and then neutral. Uh, but this large area of negative anomaly showing up. And we're going to have to watch this too and see how this persists or evolves over time. Uh, this map updated on the 3rd of April. So it's about a week old. It takes a while for this to update again. And again, we're not really seeing a large blossoming of the warm water pool over here or over here making their way to the surface. So the jury is still out, in my opinion, as to what the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomena, what we call the ENSO, is really going to do. So let's take a look now at the pressure pattern. This is the SOI. And this, too, 
you know, until this goes negative and stays negative, when we look at today's contributor, positive 19.25, the 30-day average sitting at 3.03. Uh, the 90-day has dipped below because we had some negatives recently, and as these negative numbers mix out, this number should come back up. Typically, when we see a minus 7 or so is what the Bureau of Meteorology down in Australia, who keeps track of this, that's what they typically look at as a, uh, an El Nino type pressure pattern, one that is consistently negative, and we haven't seen that yet. And you know, it may come. I've seen some talk about uh, an MJO or a westerly wind burst coming up, which would help to foster this El Nino idea. But as long as I see these positive numbers right here, um, there is no definitive argument to be made that El Nino is definitely on the way. And if so, it's probably going to be delayed. And remember what the Euro was showing here. This is initialized from the 1st of March here. And as I highlight this for you, uh, really showing if you try to draw some kind of a median in here somewhere, that's just my eyeballing it. You know, a healthy El Nino, uh, moderate to strong, by the time we get to the peak months of the hurricane season, it'll be interesting to see what the April 1st plume uh, shows. And this is an ensemble plume, the 51 different members of the ECMWF seasonal forecast indicating back on March 1st, I showed you this before, a pretty substantial El Nino coming for the 3.4 area. That's the kind of the western to central Pacific region of the ENSO region, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So, uh, put me over here to talk to you for a second. So the seasonal forecast, the first quantitative uh, forecast from Dr. Klotzbach and his team, uh, released at the National Tropical Weather Conference in South Padre and on the web almost simultaneously a few days ago. And if you haven't seen it, we'll go over it in just a moment. Um, but again, what I'm going to show you, I'll talk about it first and then show you the numbers. For the most part, I think the inhibiting factors that Dr. Klotzbach is looking at would be the possibility of this El Nino coming into play because the El Nino typically creates higher than normal wind shear across the tropical Atlantic. That's what the Pacific has to do with the Atlantic. The warming of the Pacific typically produces higher than normal shear across the Atlantic. And then maybe the demise of the warm AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Fancy way of saying that the Atlantic, tropical Atlantic especially, may be cooling off, not allowing as much instability, moisture, energy, etc. But as I showed you, the MDR doesn't look all that hostile right now. It's only April 3rd, so it really doesn't matter at the moment. We have to wait and see what it looks like a few months from now, right? So this is uh, Dr. Klotzbach's forecast right here, uh, just to recap it for you. And looking at a total of about 11 named storms, of which four would become hurricanes. And out of those four hurricanes, uh, two would become major hurricanes, category three or above. All right, so you don't add all these up. It's 11 named storms. Four of those named storms become hurricanes. Two of those hurricanes, his team and he, and he are predicting two of those to become major hurricanes. And what's a major hurricane? Well, category three or higher, and that's on the Saffir Simpson scale. Remember that the category does not tell you much about what damage is going to happen from the other effects outside of wind. This is something that I probably need to go into in much more detail on a future video discussion, really explaining hurricane effects. I don't think enough people understand, and it's obvious because people are still uh, getting killed by hurricanes in ways that I personally believe is unacceptable. Any loss of life, of course, should be unacceptable, but considering the technology that we have, the best satellite technology that we have ever had, the warning system and the availability of that information to get out to people, we are losing people, especially in the developed world, uh, and we shouldn't, okay? And so I'm going to talk about why that is the case and what we can do about it in future video updates and uh, really to help you make sure you understand. So there it is, 11, 4, and 2. This will get updated a few times. Um, throughout the season as more data comes in. And again, to me, I'll be watching this, this, and this the closest over the coming weeks and months to see how things evolve. 
And again, a big thanks to the National Tropical Weather Conference, sponsored and presented by and underwritten by USAA. Uh, you see the pictures down there. Those are some great people to come and listen to and, like I said, to interact with on an intimate basis to be able to really converse with them and not just get your picture taken with them as a fan. People can really dig in and just regular weather weenies that like this kind of stuff that are attached to it in a very real way because these hurricanes affect them both personally, maybe even professionally in their work or something. This tropical weather conference very, very good for that. And I was a, uh, I was part of it. I was a speaker on Friday. My presentation was very well received, and I appreciate being able to do that. Sort of my way of sharing and showcasing the results of what we have done with our projects. Real quick, lower 48 weather, a fairly calm period coming up compared to last week. There are still people stuck because of the severe weather that impacted Atlanta, and oh my goodness, what a mess. I feel for those people, but ah, what can you do, right? Anyway, today, the risk for the most part uh, confined, here let me exit out of the toolbar for a second, confined to parts of Texas, mostly Texas right now, and parts of the Great Lakes region in and around Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana, maybe southeast Wisconsin as some instability comes through the region, but you notice we don't have any of the enhanced or moderate going on, but don't let that fool you. Anywhere in this area is prone to having Hey, you know what? If a severe thunderstorm happens over your house, then it matters to you, right? And that's what I basically want to point out in these particular updates here that I show you, uh, not related to the tropics, you know, just keeping you weather aware. All right, so day uh, two, we go in and you see, again, not much risk overall. We're not having any big severe weather outbreaks on a wide scale. But again, locally, you just never know. So keep on top of it. If you live in these areas and you know people in the, these areas, just keep them reminded of it. Finally, as we move on out to day three and the convective outlook for that time frame, maybe a more enhanced area overall as we get into this time period closer in the Great Plains, the, the traditional Tornado Alley area through here. Uh, it's only marginal now, but I would expect maybe this will go up overall as we get through the next couple of days and closer to with more model data, etc. So there you go. Uh, again, just a kind of a look at things, you know, when I talk about each week with the sea surface temperature anomalies, etc. You know, again, no big changes. We don't see any, wow, that's really negative here or positive there. Uh, sort of a status quo, but no major inroads to the El Nino just yet. And we are now inside well inside of 60 days until the hurricane season in the Atlantic Basin begins. All right, so we'll be watching closely. Again, a lot to talk about over the coming weeks. We're almost there. I'll be working on the hurricanetrack.com website. I'm going to prepare a blog in written and graphical format, and I'm going to title it, um, We Need to Talk About Water. It's a little teaser for you. And then I'm going to discuss it here in the video because we can do a lot more with video, and including video examples because seeing is believing and really talking about the power of water uh, over the next few weeks because you know we do worry about the wind I don't want to discount that but people generally are not dying from wind and what's in the wind in hurricanes tornadoes are very efficient lethal killing machines as far as wind goes obviously but it is storm surge and freshwater flooding that is taking lives and we need to do more to get that number as close to and hopefully to zero as possible All right, so I'm going to be working on that. I'll take my responsibility to teach what I know about that very seriously and try to convey that to you and maybe you can convey that to somebody you know or love and we can save a life. That would be nice. Have a great rest of your Monday as always. Thank you for tuning in. I am Mark Sutta for HurricaneTrack.com. Great to be back home. No traveling for the next several weeks. A lot of work to do to get ready for the hurricane season. And it'll be here before you know it. Again, have a great rest of the week ahead. I'll talk to you again next week.